Is this one of the world's most dangerous millennials? Mohammed bin Salman, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, better known as MBS. To some, he's a revolutionary who has transformed life in Saudi Arabia, especially for women. To others, he's a butcher who fueled a bloody war in Yemen and, the CIA believes, approved an operation to kill or capture a Washington Post journalist who was cut up with a bone saw. Now, thanks to the global energy crisis, the crown prince looks stronger than ever and world leaders are queuing up to get their hands on his oil. I think the kingdom is in a uniquely uh, powerful position with what is happening in Ukraine. So what will he do next? MBS is a very dangerous man who is becoming more dangerous because of the power he's accumulating. After hours in Saudi Arabia, men and women mixing freely and a female DJ on the decks. The Economist's Nicholas Pelham was filming the scene. I think I had to do a double take. It was really quite an astonishing sight. Just a few years ago, all this would have been illegal. Public entertainment was banned, and unmarried men and women were not allowed to socialize. Saudi Arabia, for all the time that I've known it, until about the last sort of five or six years, has been a society where public sport space was ruled by religious police. What I found so hard to grapple with was just how normal it all felt. I don't understand how you can live with one set of values and then supplant them with another as if nothing had really happened. In the past, Saudi Arabia was governed according to a strict interpretation of Islam. Clerics controlled everything, from social life to the role of women. The kingdom uh, really was ruled through a joint venture, if you want, between the royal family and the hardline religious establishment. And it was an ultra-conservative establishment. You know, controlled education, controlled the public narrative. That was until the rise of Mohammed bin Salman. The young crown prince stripped the clerics of their power, increased women's rights, including giving them the right to drive, and all in a radically short period of time. If you look at it in a historical context of what societies had to go through to neuter their conservative right-wing religious class, that usually only happened with civil wars. This has all happened without a single cleric being, you know, killed or no violence on the streets. And I think that is virtually miraculous, really. So who is the man behind these changes? MBS is a millennial who enjoys flaunting his wealth. He splashed out over 200 million pounds on a French chateau. The economist was given a rare chance to sit down with him in 2016 and found a prince ready for power. There wasn't a single question that he shied away from. Um, his responses were imaginative and detailed, and he was forthcoming. And I think what came across perhaps most stridently was a, a sense of conviction. He really believed in his ability to change the kingdom. Despite his confidence, few could have predicted MBS's rise. In Saudi Arabia's ruling dynasty, the House of Saud, power usually passes sideways, from brother to brother. MBS's father, Salman, had several older brothers ahead of him in line for succession. But when two died, he was able to take the throne, opening up the way for MBS to succeed him. Although he still had several older half-brothers ahead of him in line for the throne. It wasn't clear that the line of succession was going to pass from one generation to the next. And if you were going to move to the next generation, there were many princes who were far better known. Mohammed bin Salman was a, uh, an unknown quantity. But his father, Salman, had a soft spot for him. So when he became king in 2015, he increased MBS's portfolio. These are just some of the titles he was given. Then in 2017, according to insider reports, MBS forced his cousin to step aside as crown prince. There was, seemed to have been something of a standoff. Mohammed bin Naif and his guards were disarmed. Mohammed bin Naif was told that your time is, is up. The Council of Allegiance has decided that you are no longer the crown prince and I'm going to fill your shoes. After this, 
MBS wasted no time in cementing his power. It's a shakeup sending shockwaves across the kingdom and the world. Saudi Arabia detaining top officials in a sweeping corruption probe. He invited the wealthiest men in the kingdom, along with the world's business elite, to a conference on the future of the Saudi economy, a self-styled Davos in the desert. And a short time later, he used the opportunity to hold many of them in a luxury hotel. He rounded up um, the leading princes and the richest businessmen, interrogated them, got them to reveal their banking details. Thereafter, it was very clear that the real only ruler in the kingdom was now Mohammed bin Salman. Since then, his aggression and repressive behavior have escalated. He has consolidated power around his own court. Human rights groups estimate thousands have been detained. And in March this year alone, 81 were executed. The government has maintained an extremely tight control of society. And I think that is a price the kingdom has had to pay for social peace as it transitions through this wrenching process. Some are much more skeptical. Khalid al-Jabri says he knows firsthand how brutal the regime can be. When, when all you have is a hammer, everything becomes a, or everybody becomes a nail. That's exactly what MBS is doing. And his list of victims will keep expanding uh, inside and outside Saudi Arabia unless somebody decides to put a check on him. Khalid lives in America, but his roots are in Saudi Arabia. I come from a big family uh, in terms of Western standards. I'm the eldest, uh, six boys and, and, and two girls, including Omar and Sara. They were funny, uh, smart, very, very ambitious. In 2017, Omar and Sara were banned from leaving the kingdom. Three years later, they were seized by the authorities. There were 20 unmarked civilian cars that showed up uh, with 50 officers in plain clothes that went into the house and basically took Omar and Sara. Khalid's father was an advisor to the former crown prince, Mohammed bin Nayef. Khalid thinks his siblings' travel ban has been used by MBS to try to pressure his dad to return to the kingdom. And he has seen messages from MBS to his father, which he believes support this. What's so unique about our case is Mohammed bin Salman can deflect responsibility on uh, on rogue Asians or that he doesn't know about it. It's a complicated story. Khalid's dad is also accused of stealing billions of dollars from the Saudi government, which he denies. Meanwhile, Khalid worries about his own security. I think like my father, I made uh, peace with the fact that one day I will probably be harmed. And who can blame him? MBS has famously been linked to the murder of outspoken former royal court insider and journalist Jamal Khashoggi, who was dismembered with a bone saw in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Nicholas knew him personally. We were due to meet actually in Istanbul uh, the weekend that he, he disappeared. I think Mohammed bin Salman, he wanted to send a message that this is what happens when you question my authority. MBS has said he takes responsibility for the murder, but denies ordering it. For a time, it looked like the killing could jeopardize the kingdom's relationship with one of its closest allies, America. We were going to, in fact, make them pay the price and make them, in fact, the pariah that they are. Saudi Arabia has long been a strategic ally in the Middle East. Successive presidents have happily sold arms to Saudi leaders. We really have a great friendship, a great relationship. Crown Prince, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. It's also home to the world's largest accessible oil reserves. And thanks to the energy crisis caused by the war in Ukraine, President Biden's threats now look empty. The message from Ukraine has been that the global economy still depends on oil from the Gulf. It was also significant that it wasn't just uh, Biden who came to Saudi Arabia. It was also the most powerful leaders in uh, the Arab world. It was almost as if Mohammed bin Salman was sending the message, I am your address in the Middle East. If you want to have a relationship with the Middle East, if you want to keep uh, Russia and, and China away from dominating the region, deal with me.
So where might change come from? Let's start in the kingdom itself. There may be little overt opposition, but some, including religious hardliners, are unhappy with his reforms. Mohammed bin Salman really is ruling by fear. I saw it on my recent visits more than I've ever seen it before. It does beg the question, as it has for other uh, totalitarian leaders in the Middle East, how long can you continue to rule by fear and by force? And at what point could there be a breaking point? Another weak point is the economy. Since taking power, he has dedicated himself to diversifying the kingdom away from oil. With everything from tourism to flashy eco-cities, like Neon. You see ancient lands. We see the world tomorrow. This is Neom. But despite the glossy PR promises of new cities in the sand, unemployment is still in double figures. While many of the oil-related subsidies Saudis have traditionally enjoyed are gone. He hasn't really had much success in diversifying revenues. The kingdom is still heavily dependent on oil and looks as if it will be for the foreseeable future. So what, what does that mean if, if, he, if he can't deliver? And if you see a rise in economic frustration, there's a huge question mark as to whether that could also translate into political frustration. So what about threats beyond the kingdom? The most immediate is right on his doorstep, in Yemen. As defense minister back in 2015, one of the first things MBS did was intervene in a bloody war to crush Houthi rebels, who were being supported by the kingdom's arch rival, Iran. But seven years on, the Houthis have forced the better armed Saudis into a ceasefire, which still leaves the kingdom looking exposed. Well, the kingdom is very vulnerable. Houthis have been succeeding in getting through, although Saudi air defense have improved their game considerably over the past uh, couple of years. But still, the kingdom is a very wide geographic um, space, and that makes it particularly vulnerable to drones uh, and other um, projectiles that come either from Iran or from Iran's um, proxies. But perhaps the greatest threat to the crown prince might be MBS himself. He's shown himself to be ego-driven, aggressive and impulsive. And perhaps it's only so long before he makes a fatal misjudgment. Is it his own recklessness? Is it his own brutality? Is it his own uh, uh, desire to be the only voice in the kingdom that could ultimately prove his undoing. For sound policy, you need to have people who can say no. And at the moment, in Saudi Arabia, everyone is, is too scared to say anything but yes. We put the allegations in this film to the royal court in Saudi Arabia. It declined to comment. But in response to a related piece about MBS in The Economist, it denied all allegations against the crown prince, insisting they are fabricated and without foundation. It continued, the kingdom is unfortunately used to false accusations made against its leadership, usually based on politically or other motivated malicious sources. Check out these two Saudi princes. This one's the 57-year-old crown prince. And this one, the one doing all the hand kissing, is his younger cousin. Listen to what the older cousin is saying. He's being forced to give up his power and to pass the crown prince title to his younger cousin, a guy who's almost half his age. This is Mohammed bin Salman. In the West, we just call him MBS. And since this moment in June, he's consolidated power so swiftly and so thoroughly that in Saudi Arabia, they just know him as Mr. Everything. As Crown Prince, MBS will become king. And with all of this new power, MBS is seeking to assert his dominance throughout the Middle East. One of his big policies has been a vehement opposition to Saudi Arabia's neighbor, Iran. And on that note, he has found an ally in the White House. 
Inside the kingdom, MBS is also seeking to cement his authority and dominance over the royal family. Saudi Arabia's young crown prince arresting hundreds of his own cousins and crackdown on corruption. Eleven princes and nearly 40 current or former officials detained, reportedly being held at the lavish Ritz Carlton. Yes, if you're a Saudi prince, jail is the Ritz Carlton. MBS called this a corruption crackdown, and he branded himself as the financially responsible anti corruption leader. But we're talking about a guy who recently purchased one of the most expensive homes in the world, and who last year spent a half a billion dollars on a painting. He clearly had other motives for this crackdown beyond fiscal responsibility. One thing to realize is that the Saudi royal family is made up of thousands of members who use public money generated from oil revenues to fund their unthinkably excessive lifestyles. So it wouldn't be hard for MBS to crack down on anyone he wants to. Coming into power, MBS's second big move was to loosen the strict moral and social rules of the kingdom. He stripped the religious police of their right to make arrests. He expanded women's rights in society, including giving them the right to drive. On the surface, these are progressive social reforms meant to modernize Saudi society. But like the anti-corruption crackdowns, the move is another effort to seize power. Saudi society is built on a sort of pact between the royal family, which is called the House of Saud, and the vast religious establishment run by conservative Islamic clerics. The clerics give the Saud family legitimacy by giving them their blessing as rulers of the kingdom. In exchange, the family allows the clerics to strictly enforce their uncompromising, puritanical version of Islam within the kingdom. This Faustian bargain means that Saudi princes, like MBS and others, can live these indulgent lifestyles and make deals with the West, but still retain religious legitimacy in the eyes of the public. It's a balance that has kept the kingdom stable in this very volatile region. But now MBS has violated his family's part of the bargain arresting hardline clerics who might speak out against his progressive reforms. This could shake one of the foundational pillars of Saudi society. The third way MBS is shaking up the kingdom is his plans for the economy. The kingdom's revenue comes almost entirely from oil. Demand for oil has remained solid for decades, and Saudi has reaped the rewards of that. But in 2014, the price of oil started to drop, and it became clear that betting the entire kingdom's economy on this one resource was a dangerous strategy for the future. So MBS wants to end what he calls this oil addiction in order to prepare for a world after oil. He's laid out a vision for privatizing a lot of the sectors within the Saudi economy and breaking up this giant government-owned oil business. But this reform could also create more instability. Thanks to the endless oil money, Saudi citizens are entitled to a lifelong set of benefits like free healthcare and subsidized housing. But as MBS tries to privatize the economy and move away from oil, this subsidized lifestyle that so many Saudis enjoy could be threatened. And the public support that has kept this monarchy so solid for so many years could begin to dwindle. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is on the brink of one of the biggest transformations in its history. As this young leader consolidates power to upend the status quo, he may also upend the pillars that have kept the kingdom one of the most stable countries in the Middle East. They acted like old college buddies. These two men are, for many here, the pariahs of this G20 summit. President Vladimir Putin is in hot water over Russia's seizure of Ukrainian ships after a clash in the Black Sea. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, meanwhile, is accused of ordering the murder of dissident Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi in Istanbul. Saudi Arabia says the Crown Prince had no role in it. The CIA says he did. US President Donald Trump disagrees with his own intelligence agency. Trump denied talking with a man known as MBS. Earlier at the traditional family photo, the Crown Prince cut something of an isolated figure, nobody wanting to shake his hand. When it came to the clicking of cameras, Bin Salman was on the edge of the frame. France's Emmanuel Macron was later said to have given him some firm words. He can probably expect a few more by the end of the summit.
One. The population gonna jump in Saudi Arabia from today 33 million in 2030 something between 50 to 55 million. So in 2030 we're gonna reach the full capacity of the existing infrastructure of Saudi Arabia. That's raised very important question that we need to create new city. They say in a lot of projects that happen in Saudi Arabia it can be done. This is very ambitious. They can't keep saying that and we can keep proving them wrong. So since we have empty place and we want to have a place for 10 million people, then let's think from scratch. So we talk about a lot of ideas. Why can't we build a circle and we start to connect it with movement, mobilities, trains, whatever, and then we start to build it slowly till it's completed for 10 million people. We brainstorm, we work with the team, we did a competition with the best designer on the whole planet, all of them, they provide us cities based on the existing methods, but in, with a better solutions. Except one, adopt that ID, and he say, let's turn it from a circle to a line. Northwest of Saudi Arabia, untouched, almost empty. It have mix of topography, mountains, valleys, oases, dunes, beaches, islands, corals, from skiing till diving, that's the place. When he presented the line and turned from circle to a line, it was the width of it, it's almost two kilos. My problem that the infrastructure idea is good, but when you get in it with a two kilo of width, you don't feel it. I told the team, how about if we take that two kilo and we flip it to two towers to the whole line? Does that gonna work? It's gonna be massive. You know, any new city, it has to be top down. All the cities that we have today exi existing, it's based in all cities, problem, solution, problem, solution. So the existing model of cities, it's based on problem and solution because it's being fixed all the time. But if it's top down, then you can design something like this. Engineering and designer is not enough without art. Don't want to create a city without having the, city, the whole city as a piece of art. You have the models now, we work on it. It sounds it's very doable and the ideas is like amazing so it's it's massive it's huge I, I, I wish that I can explain it uh, in a smaller uh, way but it's project making money it's project absorbing the demand that we assumed in Saudi uh, Arabia and it's something that create the new way of uh, building city a new way of living all cities based in problem and solution and car is solution for a problem I have a friend who moved to, he's an American friend, who moved to Miami. In Miami, when you get out from your office, you're on vacation. Immediately, you're next to entertainment, culture, sport, retails. So each day, it has to be excitement to finish your work and go and enjoy it in New York. So we are competing with Miami in that area. We think about what kind of opportunity we have. So we have the cash, we have the land, we have the stability, we have uh, good infrastructure, we are a G20 country. We want to create the new civilization for tomorrow and we need to encourage other nations to keep doing the same things for a better uh, planet. Well, we are bringing all the piece of puzzle together, I don't know what's the outcome of it. That gonna be the creativity of the people gonna live from the whole globe in, uh, in New York. I can promise you that gonna be something new and creative but what is it? It's unknown. We're gonna see.